say power. People. Power. People. Power. People. Power. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm very excited and humbled to be here. My name is Gina Belafonte. I am the executive director of Sankofa.org, a nonprofit organization that works at the intersection of art and activism. And uh, you can learn more about Sankofa.org at, you guessed it, Sankofa.org. <laughs> we have an exciting um, conversation happening this afternoon here. Um, there's been many exciting conversations going on all throughout the building, all throughout the campus. We are um, envisioning our future here, and we're using culture as that lens to envision our future. We have some presentations that have been prepared, and we also have some conversation and questions and dialogue to share. Uh, one of our panelists had to leave, but Ernesto Yarena has um, donated to this forum some beautiful poster art um, that is very reflective of the work that he does as an artist. And so please feel free after the session, or really at any time, as long as you're cool and smooth about it, <laughs> to come and, <laughs> and take a poster um, for yourself to have. So let's give Ernesto a round of applause. So as it's, okay, come on, I know you, you're like dying, you want one right away, go ahead. Um, so as it says in the program, this session explores the role of culture in building and amplifying people's resistance and social movements, as well as in shaping the radical imagination of our present and future. Speakers will share their experiences in creating projects that resist the capitalist logic of cultural and artistic production and that rally a people-centered future. Again, I'm Gina Belafonte, and our panelists today include Roberto Lavato. <laughs> Roberto Lavato is an author of Unforgetting, a groundbreaking memoir, which is a no-holds-barred take of gang life, guerrilla warfare, intergenerational trauma, and the interconnected violence between the US and El Salvador, the New York Times picked as an editor's choice. Please welcome Roberto Lovato. Please welcome Natalia Linares. Natalia Nati Linares is a communications and cultural organizing strategist at the New Economy Coalition, a network of over 200 organizations in the United States and Canada envisioning a just transition to a better social, cultural, and economic system. Nati comes to the solidarity economy movement after over a decade of witnessing inequities in the music and media industry. I will let you know who Ernesto Yarena is. He is a born El Centro in El Centro, California, a mid-sized farming town bordering Mexicali. Fueled by his cross-national upbringing, his art practice reflects his observations of the views and interactions between the Mexican communities living on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico. on immigration, migration, and dance, which is a question I have for you later, about the healing, um, the healing properties that dance gives us. Um, so please welcome Ana Maria. Mm -hmm. 
And also we have Raul Amorim. Raul is a leader of the landless workers movement of Brazil. The MST, Brazil's landless workers movement, is a mass social movement for land reform and against injustice and social inequity in rural areas. The MST was born through a process of occupying large land estates with families fighting for the realization of their political, social, economic, environmental, and cultural rights. Currently, there are approximately 900 encampments holding 150,000 landless families in Brazil. Also joining us via video is Israel Rojas from Cuba. Is Israel Rojas is a vo vocalist, composer, and leader of the Buena Fe duo, the Buena Fe duo, together with Yoel Martinez, who is a lawyer by profession. This, his troubadour training is present in all their lyrics and is full of reflection on the current Cuban reality. Buena Fe duo. Music has a contemporary sound which creates musical arrangements from the most varied genres of Cuban music, including with pop and rock influences. And of course, we very much welcome them to the People's Forum here today because they, Cuba was not included in the other thing taking place across the way. So. The role of culture in building and amplifying people's resistance and social movements is uh, an interesting and quite arduous at times, but very rewarding task. So we're going to today share with each other in conversation, in presentation, some of the strategies that have been used to organize and contribute to movement building. So I'm going to ask a question. I'll have all the panelists, if they choose, not everyone necessarily has to answer the question. After we have a question, we'll then have a, pre a short presentation from one of our panelists. After that presentation, we'll ask another question. We'll hear from the panelists, and then we'll have another presentation after that, so on. I think you get the, the idea. Okay, so for our first question, and anyone feel free to chime in. What is the role of art and culture in movements for liberation. Mm -hmm. We ask this question when we think of movements against white supremacy, against poverty, war, and gentrification. So what is the role of art and culture in movements for liberation, and how have you used your medium to contribute to, organize, to this organizing process or movement building? I could jump in. <laughs> um, so, so I definitely f feel like the... Just say your name again. Oh, Ana Maria is my name. Uh, the, the, when I think about uh, art, and I think about culture, and I think about um, making inside of community, I think about joy, and I think about um, our connection to one another, and our connection to the things that make us feel alive, and make us feel that are worth living for, right? And so um, those things that we have access to through, whether it's music, whether it's dance, whether it's you know, visual arts, whether it's being in community and, and loving and, and laughing and telling stories, all of those mediums give us access to our humanity. And so that idea that art and culture being at the center of any liberation movement makes sense because otherwise what are we fighting for? What are we actually engaging in all of this discourse, all of this struggle, all of this pushing is to be able to be more human, to be more connected, to be more alive. And so that is what art and culture is. And so, so the, there's a way in which I think our movements have kind of seen sometimes the work that we do as on the side or as a icing on the cake or something that is actually helpful in, in some sort of areas and not. And, and I think what we're becoming clued cl 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 into and closer um, to kind of the feeling of is that, that art and culture is, is critical 
to our liberation. It's critical to the fight. It's critical to the struggle. And I mean, I say this, I come from a movement family. My parents were union organizers. I'm a red diaper baby. Um, I grew up in the Communist Workers Party. And I, and I very much, I know in, in this area, woo, yes, I don't usually get a woo for that, but we can do that. <laughs> um, and I, I saw in my upbringing so much love, so much joy, so much connection and community inside of my family and inside of my village. Um, and inside of movement spaces, I saw a lot of struggle and a lot of, of effort made towards the struggle. I always joke my dog's name was Lucha growing up. And I would explain to people that means struggle in Spanish. People look at me like I'm crazy. And that idea that La Lucha being at the center of the movement, I think many of the artists from um, my generation and younger who grew up in movement households are realizing we got to center joy. We got to center love. We got to center pleasure inside of the movement. Otherwise, again, what are we fighting for? So that's, yeah. You've inspired me to want to take a moment to actually acknowledge the ancestors mm -hmm. and acknowledge our elders and those who have paved a way for us to be here today, who have struggled mm -hmm. uh, and have fought and have strategized and given us roadmaps so let us just take a moment to acknowledge the ancestors, our indigenous and native ancestors, our African ancestors, all our relations that bring us here today, and of course acknowledging the land that we are on, as always. Anyone else wanna take on that question? What is the role of art and culture in movements for liberation? I can, I can continue. Is that me? Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Mathy, she, her. I'm actually not the only maybe non-artist on the stage, um, but I am a creator. I'm a mother of two, so I am a culture bearer, yes. and hopefully my babies are watching, <laughs> eight months old and two and a half. Um, but I am here as someone who has spent time both working very closely with musicians, um, artists, and journalists. Um, in the business, right, the music business, um, all that behind the scenes work that, um, you know, how you learn about a show, uh, the people who build the recording equipment, uh, the people who put your music in TV and film and video, um, the people who process the contracts to get artists paid. That's kind of the world where I, I came from. Um, and this is just within the music business, which I know the best. You have to think about all of the cultures in arts and culture, theater, uh, fashion. Um, we're in the fashion district here right now. Um, these are the people that make it possible. Um, and I'm also someone who witnessed in the last six years, um, I left that world of the music business because of how misogynistic it was, um, how it, it is an essentially a monopoly. <laughs> there is a lot of consolidation in the music business. There are only three major record labels that pretty much dominate all of the, the music that you hear. Um, and again, this is just the music business. Think about all the cultural sectors that um, we think of when we talk about arts and culture. Um, I experienced in this body all the gatekeeping, right? And kind of the celebrityfication of fame seeking and the kind of winners take all economy that also I I exists in the music business, in the culture industry. Um, and I, now in, in the position that I sit now, I can have that analysis of how capitalism um, and those dynamics play out for artists and the workers who are, who, um, are in the culture industry. Um, so that was in my 20s, <laughs> um, unfortunately. And you know, I left that world um, and was lucky enough to get into the world of economic justice organizing, where I now work with the New Economy Coalition, which is a network building the power of the solidarity economy in the United States. I'm so glad we're here steeped in internationalism and we have so much to learn from MST and movements all over the global south, but it, that movement is still very small in the US. <laughs> um, it's this world of organizers, worker owners, radical attorneys, um, housing justice visionaries, farmers, all the working people that are building a solidarity economy right now. Um, I actually, before I continue, how many of you have heard that, that term before, solidarity economy? Okay, maybe like 30%, that's cool. Um, when I first started working at the New Economy Coalition um, in 2016, I actually was not familiar with solidarity economy at all as an economic framework. 
Um, I was familiar with worker co-ops somewhat, right? Maybe you, you know, have shopped at a, at a food co-op. Um, I had heard about participatory budgeting, right? Where maybe in, in Brazil, where participatory budgeting was founded, where you could actually decide on your city uh, budget and decide projects that city money is spent on. Um, I was familiar with the urban homesteaders movement in New York City, right? Where mostly black and brown and working class folks were squatting abandoned buildings in the late 70s um, and folks were organizing to put those buildings into permanent affordability. I had heard about these things. My partner actually grew up in one of these apartments and it's the reason why he could stay in his building to this day in a very gentrified neighborhood. Um, I had heard about artists who were working together and forming collectives. I'm sh I've met a lot of people here today who are part of collectives. I participated in clothing swaps, right, where I could bring my unworn clothes and, and get other folks' clothes and have a whole new wardrobe for free. Um, maybe I rented a tool from a power library. Like, I knew all of these things, but I didn't know that they were united under this framework of solidarity economy. Um, yes, yeah, so... Um, you know, yesterday, Melina from BLM uh, Los Angeles said that we deserve to struggle for, not just against. And it's something I've been hearing today, too, as well. Cindy also talked about this, of, you know, the alternatives that we need to actually build, not just proclaim. Um, and, uh, and, and forgive me for preparing my remarks. I'm somebody that's more behind the scenes. No, I like to prepare. Um, you know, during the last six years of working at the New Economy Coalition, having come from the music business, being a normie to social movements, um, I was enlivened to learn that there were real tangible projects that were happening on the ground, um, that people were struggling for the economy that they deserved, that they were in the process of building these alternatives right now. Um, and so, you know, for the other 70% of you that didn't raise your hand, that didn't know what a solidarity economy is, um, I learned that a solidarity economy is a movement to build just and sustainable systems where we prioritize people and planet over endless profit. Like Manolo said yesterday, you're either for people and planet or you're for capitalism. And just so the 70% of you know, there are people on the ground right now building this solidarity economy. Um, I learned that solidarity economy grew out of social movements in Latin America and the global south, many of whom are here today and, and are more familiar with this. And I also learned that solidarity economy comes out of legacies of the civil rights movement in the United States, of black and indigenous folks um, in the U.S. who had always had to, you know, create these solutions for themselves to create this economy. Um, you know, I learned how communities were governing themselves through democracy, cooperative and public ownership, um, a culture of solidarity and respect for the earth. Um, an organizer in Boston uh, with the Boston Ujima Project, they're creating a black-led solidarity economy ecosystem in Boston right now, described it as, we are not trying to create something from scratch. We're not trying to perform magic. What we are doing is discovering the ways of being that we've already known, which have been buried, which have been terrorized out of us, and we're combining that with newer ways of being, and we're making sure that we're doing it every day, which is culture work, right? Yeah. Um, so if there's one thing I wanna leave with my remarks, and which others have stressed here really powerfully, it's that it won't be enough for us to resist these forces, the common enemies that Claudia spoke about yesterday so powerfully, um, but that we have to build these alternatives. And most importantly, the same goes for artists and culture builders who have to participate in this world building, this solidarity economy building. Um, and what I've learned as someone who worked in the music business for 10 years in that capitalist culture industry wheel and all that I experienced um, with the experience of being awakened to these alternatives and solidarity economy building that's happening is that artists need a solidarity economy if they are to overcome their status as exploited workers. And likewise, if the solidarity economy, <laughs> straight up, art is labor, art is labor. Um, and likewise, our movement for a solidarity economy is really detached from artists and culture makers. We're not speaking to, I bumped into a musician who performed here yesterday and felt intimidated about talking about capitalism and systems work and felt like he didn't know anything, like he didn't belong in this room. And I said, bro, 
you are exactly the person that needs to be in this room and speaking to your experience as a musician of how you are constantly taken advantage of as a musician. Um, so we, solidarity economy movements, need artists and culture bearers too. Um, and so after the, over the last two years, I've just been focused on how do we bridge that conversation in the for-profit arts world and in the non-profit arts world and in the world of social movements and solidarity economy building um, about what it would take to center artists in systems change work. Um, and so that artists are included, resourced, centered in building these solutions, not just making the beautiful propaganda and art that we need, yes, that is so important, but also that they are a part of building their own economic systems for themselves to get the things that they need and to stop faking it till they make it, which you know I know a lot are doing that. Um, and so I actually wanted to share a video that I think could um, articulate much better than maybe I just have of this like very embryonic work that's happening in the US of artists really centering systems change in their work and building this solidarity economy. So hopefully it'll be queued up right now and you can check out art.coop. If you are an artist who's been like, wow, capitalism, anti-imperialism, whoa, there is a place for you at art.coop. We're building a directory um, so artists can learn about these examples so that they can get access to resourcing um, besides creating these works to actually participate um, in building co-ops and doing land projects. Um, and hopefully you can check it out. I think it should be queuing up. Um, Before we go to the video, yes. and first of all, thank you so much for yes, that presentation. And, and while they're looking for the video and potentially queuing it up, I just want to um, offer the gentleman an opportunity to answer the first question if you want to contribute to the what is the role of art and culture in movements for liberation. Let's see. Ah, boa tarde a todos e a todas. Eu vou tentar falar nos cinco desafios do que está acontecendo. Antes, isso é uma coisa que a gente é um prazer muito grande da gente estar participando aqui com relação aos pueblos. Eu estou aqui. A gente está falando sobre os desafios. That's very important, and that's for the culture. Is that something very fundamental? And is the team of the fight of ideological is very difficult uh, with the lefty to comprehend the relation with the economy. If we get together and get the pieces, we will have a lot of difficulties to build uh, this revolution. So this team, there is something that's very important for us to talk five ideas. The first idea is the idea of resist resistance co cultural, the active resistance. And to talk about that, before everything, since we're talking about it, like about solidarity, is the, I would like to, to talk about like the solidarity. Uh, and then the second thing, it's after the situation that we have in, uh, for part of the situation that we had in New York with the pol the, the policy. Uh, talk about like the, the situation that we're going through right now. We don't have to talk not even one uh, step forward there for the situation that is going through right now. So for the experience that we're having right now, culturally talking about, nationality talking about, after that, thinking about like the resistance of like with the power of building a new um, a new situation offensive, like resistant active, re like resistance in terms of like we move forward, also with the problems that we have with the domination of the power, like the domination of the popular power, like with the oppression of the situation. Inter interesting that we're talking about that is nothing impossible to change 
that way, and we're not going to accept the situation that the way that it is, there, right, it is right now. This situation, we have to think on a, a revolutionary uh, thought so we can change the stuff. And then the cultural plan, we have something that calls an expression that is like, I like to be a man, but go like uh, uh, um, taste is taste, and we don't talk about it. We don't discuss that. So when we talk about culture, this is like a social construction, and it's very possible to change. And uh, the dominant cause is that we have a goose, that we have a taste that they are, they're trying our capacity of our own resistance. Economically, we're dependent of the situation that it brings us security. So that's the way that, that's why we're talking about it strategically, that we have to combat. First of all, is the initi initiative of uh, freedom. And the other one is like everyone against everyone. And the second one, the third one is like individual action. And this search is like, is this a celebration of a like, we can uh, translate in the capacity of like combat what I'm talking about. We have to combat this, culturally talking about. And then the second idea is that this process of formation of an idea of a culture of neoliberalism, it's, uh, it has a meaning of, in this time, we have a concept that culture is everything that we product and we reproduct to build our existence. And then we have an idea of neoliberalism that it's against uh, against the, uh, the flow. It's like a culture is like against, instead of we product the existence, it's a culture of like a mother, it's a culture of dependency, it's a culture of uh, poisonous. And then where do you have like all this poisonous on this culture? We we talk about like uh, Maria Casolina, like Maria Gas. We wanna Maria that put gas gas in all the culture that that feed the patriarchalism of the burglism. So those ideas. Is mainly when we think about parties, like we think about like our defense and ideologic, is something that sometimes we think that is the idea of a process process of development. When we can think about our life, our existence, and when we're doing our existence, and then the culture, it's also an agriculture with the hunger and the production of our health and uh, with our work, with something that we have to think about the culture of for the whole society. We have to think of that all of us could be an artist and all of us could be doing theater and be actresses in terms of all the democracy. We're part of it. We have to bring people to product their arts and to have profit of what they're doing. And uh, the fourth idea. <laughs> now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna talk about the fourth idea. This is just the beginning. But this idea is that the culture is a part of the construction of a harmonic situation that it's part of a it's a, a economic power economics uh, social uh, power and intellectual power as well we uh, we we remember that the idea of the domi dominant classes are the class that is the power materialistic power is at the same time the same power a spiritual power so I'm not sure if it's necessary 
of talk about it, but this is a quotation of this relation of domination is what it means the work that everybody does in all the moments culturally talking about. So like when we're talking about like politician, it's like easier and faster economically and socially a little bit more. But when we talk about like the coach changes, we have to work with the like the current uh, reality. And our work is to build uh, active resistance. We have to do, we have to have like the open eyes. And look, we have like good answers for what we want for like a new world. We have a good like answers for the new world. But cultural, so what we want for the new society? I have a lot of experiences in terms of revolution, but then they can participate. We have to do it, and that's a challenge for us, like internationally talking about. So that's why we bring this here. What type of society we want? What type of society we want? We don't want the explorations. And at the end, I hope that it's like five challenges that we have here about that and then and the first i think that we can bring we cannot bring the logic of the, uh, the uh, of the thing we have to separate it uh the public we can't separate it, the public and the artists we are all artists we have to bring it all together Sec second one the culture needs to be productive like among the workers. So what do I say? We have to bring the production for us and then we can do whatever we want, the way we want with the sovereignty. But we also want the classic muse. We also want to play the violin. Like we want to do other stuff also like for the black people because we want to do everything because it's the production of the humanity. When we think about culture, don't think about like the uh, up there, there's the people with the culture and then like the popular culture, there's nothing that we can change. So we have to have revolutionary characteristics. So that's why there's not only enough to appropriate from the, uh, the, the resources that we have. So not only it's not enough to change the ways of what's going on. We have to do a different face. And for that, we have to be in service of like the worker classes. We build everything on our way. When we bring our culture, like what type of like food we're gonna eat, what clothing we're gonna use, and what type of society we're gonna live and stuff. So I have identified the situation culturally. If we wanna have a line, it's not like we have to cut everything and forget it, like the way we're living. We have to build a popular way that will be massive for everybody to get what they wanna get. And then at the end, I mean, I'm going to finish now. Hold on. And uh, we're talking about today, the best way to speak to people is like, I don't want to be like talking here, speaking, preaching. Uh, it's hard to do like a community work, but the possibility of we build like uh, cultural centers, like libraries, for our people, like festivities, culture, uh, uh, situations for our people, for the artists on the spaces. And when we have a process of like, uh, I think that that's how we're gonna build our revolution. Our unit here, we're gonna find the, the flags anti-imperialist. We wanna build a new, a new uh, society so that's why I said we have to be with the open eyes and also with the ear open also with the with the with the with our 
protective, like open also. All the senses has to be open so we can move forward. And then it's not only the like meeting with Biden that's going to New York. No, here we're gonna build the whole of work that we wanna do in our situation. Thank you so much. What's the language, you guys? What's the language, yours? Uh huh. It's Spanish, you? Trust me, your Spanish is better than mine. Can I can I say something that feels sure. connected? That so so, gracias, obrigada for all of that. I I gotta say, what resonates so much is this idea that um, we talk about in contratiempo cultural technologies, and technology being the, something that is created in society to solve a problem, right? And that the idea of like our music and dance forms are technologies. They are these things that have been created by our ancestors to create joy and resilience and power and remind us of our connection with one another. And it's not an accident that this shit is underfunded, that, it is, that, is, that we are shut down inside of, of the ways in which we function as artists. It's not an accident that I can speak in the United States that arts is deeply underfunded in schools. Young people are not taught to harness these ancestral traditions and practices that it is not an accident that that you the 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 forms that are amplified and that make a lot of money and are and are and have huge platforms are not the forms that are talking about any of the things that we're talking about here it's not that's not none of that is an accident it is art and culture is strategically used and inside of capitalism to disempower these conversations. And so I think if we as cultural workers and we can own our artistry across our humanity, that everyone is artists. Yes, we are all artists. We all have the capacity to express and to feel and to share. And if that can be the center of how we build our society, that's a, that's a society I want to raise my kids in. And, and, and that is really honestly honoring our ancestors. It's honoring these ancestral technologies that have been passed down to us and it's our responsibility to actually take them and, and move with them. So I just, yes, yes, Ashe. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, so I want to go to the, um, the clip, the video. Yes that we were going to show. I mean, there's lots to think about. There's lots to um, share. We have more presentations and questions. Um, I, uh, my question initially was, what is the role of art and culture? But it's being answered. It's being answered in everyone's presentation, which is great. Are you ready? Okay, so here we go. We're gonna show this video. Soy Israel Rojas, fiel director de la agrupación cubana Buena Fe. Desde La Habana, me han sido invitado a este forum para hablar sobre resistencias culturales. All around the country, the people who have been most harmed by our current systems are practicing self-determination and community wealth. The movement for permanently affordable space in Oakland places culture at the center of the work. The first democratically managed investment fund in the country making non-extractive loans to community members says cultural workers are economy builders. Culture bearers lead the oldest native co-op in the country. Artists started the oldest non-extractive venture capital firm in the U.S., a co-op giving 35,000 freelancers the benefit of full-time employment was founded by artists. Black Lives Matter was co-founded by an artist. This work is not new. Creatives are going back to the future, to practices of shared livelihoods rooted in cultural traditions. Why should culture and economic innovation go together? Because right now we have a superstar system where the winners take all and the rest are left with crumbs. Because just like art, Housing and dignified work are human rights. Artists are the original gig workers. Culture making and political organizing go hand in hand. We want a world where everyone's needs are met so everyone can participate in the remaking of culture and society. 
An artist living in a community land trust in New York City will have 27 hours a week to make art compared to an artist in market-priced housing who will have four hours a week for art making. We must repair centuries of injustice. What do mutual aid networks, worker co-ops, community land trust, participatory budgeting, and time banks have in common? Community ownership and democratic governance that builds political, cultural, and economic power. When these hyperlocal initiatives get together, they have enormous power. This emergent movement goes by many names. But internationally, it's known as the Social and Solidarity Economy, or Solidarity Economy for short. It provides resilience against crisis and has lasting impact when supported as a holistic system. To support this work, you can educate yourself, join existing organizing work, and advocate for economic justice. Organize a book club in your community. Read the book, Collective Courage, study toward action. Find your local credit union, work co-op or time bank and join it. Make media about this work, songs, posters, memes and stories. Make gifts and loans of time, art and money to seed these groups. Follow the lead of grassroots organizers and commit to long-term support. Advocate for legal and fiscal policies that enable the solidarity economy to thrive. The people who have been most harmed are creating community-controlled, hyper-local economies that are resilient amidst crisis. The systems that artists want are not only possible, they already exist and can be strengthened and cultivated with intention. Learn more. Art.coop. So, wonderful. Thanks for letting me show that. I just thank you. I think it encapsulates. And the voice on that is an incredible artist, um, Pink Flowers, who actually made a theater piece about the black cooperative um, history in the early 1900s and made a theater piece about this. So tangible examples of artists doing this. So thanks for watching. Awesome. Um, well, that piece leads me to my next question, which is um, to talk a little bit about um, what are some of the challenges or um, contradictions faced by cultural producers um, and in each of your in each of your mediums, and when creating art and culture, in our, in our current context, in you know imperialist war, attacks on our human and civil rights, um, the increasing poverty, what do you think is necessary to overcome these challenges and contradictions? I mean, what you've proposed is one of the one of the solutions, but I would love to hear from all of you, if you'd like, um, what you think is necessary to overcome some of these challenges um, or contradictions. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. We haven't heard from you yet. You wanna... I'm going to talk after this. Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I can, I can share my some don't, of the, Don't the be thoughts. shy. Anyone just speak, I'm, please. I, I'm a Leo, so I'm taking up all the air. <laughs> I, I will say the one of the, one of the challenges I know in terms of um, in the field of movement and dance is, is that the field is rooted in exploitation of bodies. And, mm -hmm. and with that said, our, I, our work in Contratiempo is very much about how do we, again, re-harness and re-engage these, these ancestral lineages and technologies in a way that um, roots back to how they were originally in, um, designed and devised to really be healing practices and power making practices and community building practices. Um, that, is a, that is in direct contradiction to the ways in which dan the, the economy of being a dancer, a professional dancer exists, right? I mean, you literally as an artist are one of the lowest paid gig workers. In, um, the lowest paid gig workers are, are dancers. Exactly. Um, uh, we are often asked to do things for free. We're often asked to, um, you know, uh, 
the, uh, the, the, and this is actually across the board also, but specifically dancing. Dancing is seen as something that you do as a hobby or something that you, it's, it's pleasurable, so it can't actually be a, a, a lucrative or, or viable way of m making a living. Um, often you hear artists that come to us in our organization repeating these things that they've heard from their families or heard from the spaces where they move through in terms of the university systems or any of that. And so all of these ideas of, again, going back into these, uh, these, these are practices, these are joy building practices. Um, it's got to root back to this idea of where does it start? And what we do this work through is with youth. And, and when you work with young people and you start when they are young to understand their power as bodies, their body's power, their wisdom inside of their bodies to start understanding of learning and trusting and, and, and listening to that body wisdom, um, that, is, that is the beginning of liberation practice. And so, and so inside of our school setting, right, like, like not having access to arts education, not having access to dance, not having access to instruments, not having access to any of this is, again, it's the way that th these things continue to be perpetuated. So I think we, we are looking at an entire, again, it's, I know we're hearing this over and over again, but it, capitalism is at the root of, of exploitation and, and this exploitation of bodies we can't have collective healing if we can't actually address that. Mm -hmm. As, and, and I think that's what you were talking about, right? That's exactly what you're talking about. So, yeah. Yeah. I think also in, in the places where there is access, there needs to be a huge shift um, around the narrative. Um, there is a constant narrative around the col colonial expression of art, um, the classics, which I think you brought up a bit. Um, and, you know, there's a tremendous amount, especially in the dance world as it relates to classical dance, where there's a tremendous amount of abuse yeah. um, and ageism. And I also think that, you know, in the places where there is access, we need to somehow find ways in which to infiltrate those syllabuses and those, those um, curriculums. Because th while there was the Medici family and Versailles was being built, there was also other things going on with black and brown people <laughs> that were doing and creating. And so um, we never really get the opportunity to know what was happening in that parallel universe and world. Um, I just want to make an announcement um, before we move on, which is that one of our panelists was unable to join us. Um, Ernesto Yerena, but he did leave us with some beautiful artwork of his, some protest artwork, and it is here uh, in form of poster, and so please feel free um, now or at the end of the talk to come up and, and get a poster uh, or two um, before we move on. So, with that being said, Roberto. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, before anything, I want to thank Manolo, Claudia, Hannah, and the team that organized this wonderful event. Uh, un aplauso para los, las compañeras y compañeros. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't really in a mood to come tonight be, today because... Uh, can, I ask you to, can I ask you to hold on for one second? Oh. Um, so I, I, I maybe gave the wrong idea. I would prefer it if you could come up at the end because <laughs> we're live yeah. streaming and you all are in front of the cameras. Yeah, uh, they'll yeah. be here at the end, I promise. Thank you so much for understanding. I appreciate it. I gave the wrong, I gave the wrong um, cue. My, my bad. Sorry, Roberto. And continue. So um, anyway, I, I wanted to thank the organizers because I wasn't really in a mood to come today. I... Uh, lost my dad about a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, but I, my love for the work, my love for our mission here was enough to seduce me here and um, into, like he was talking about, an act of collective healing. Mm -hmm. I draw a lot of energy from the culture of the radical imagination. And I, I want to share a little bit about my experience of it. And then you know, some, with some stories, because I'm a writer. And then I want to kind of reflect on that a little bit. So, uh, and I'm especially edified by many of you here today, because uh, uh, the vast majority of you are way younger than I am. <laughs> and 
you know, el corazón de estudiante, the, the heart of the student, like the song says, has always been at the center of radical revolutionary movements. So I once had a corazón de estudiante when I was a kid in my youth and coming of political age in my militancy in the Salvadoran Revolution. And, um, you know, I was obsessed with this term, revolución. <laughs> when I discovered it, I, I just wanted to take every, all these people's head off with that word, revolución, revolución, and it was like my lightsaber <laughs> in Star Wars. And uh, I was working out of this office, and there was an elderly man who, uh, they called him Tio Chepe. And Tio Chepe would, you know, he had a, like an eight-panel hat like my dad had, and very nice old guy, but I really, and he always wanted to talk to me. He always like, hey, Lovato, quiero, quiero platicar con vos. I want to talk with you, Lovato. And I'd be like 20-something me, hey, that's great, old man, but I, the revolution's over there. I ain't got time, bro. And so, you know, 20-something, and not like many of you, I was a 20-something dumbass. And um, so, you know, and the, and the elderly man, he would give me cassettes. And I remember this one cassette he gave me of uh, Un Concierto por la Paz en Centro America. It's actually a classic. You can look it up on Google. It'll probably cost you an arm and a leg to get an original, but it was a concert for peace in Central America that brought together people like Mercedes Sosa, Silvio Rodriguez, and this dude with a, this, with, a, with an Arabic name from Venezuela who dedicated this song to El Salvador, Ali Primera. I didn't know who he was. I didn't really kind of care because I was trying to be revolutionary. So anyway, can you cue uh, the Ali Primera song, just that beginning of it? Just so you get a sense of the music in it. Yes. <laughs> he dedicated this in the heart of the, 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 the civil war in El Salvador, which is a very savage war if you don't know about it. Ooh. Who's down here? I'll start El Pueblo Salvadoreño. Oh, let's sing it. Tiene el, pueblo, tiene el cielo por sombrero. The Salvadoran people have a sky for a hat. He knows it. Como dice? Dale Salvadoreño. It was a Beautiful. One sec, we'll, we'll hear a taste of it. But uh, this revolutionary uh, troubadour, uh, Ali Primera, who was part of, a, I would say, the Nueva Canción, the new song movement of Latin America, which was one of the major generators of revolutionary culture in the Americas. You got it? Dale. Salvadoreño tiene el cielo por sombrero. Tan alta es su dignidad en la búsqueda del tiempo en que florezca la tierra por los que han ido cayendo en que venga la alegría a lavar el sufrimiento. I'd love to play the rest of the song, but I only have a few minutes as this uh, <laughs> dude here is telling me with his time things. So, uh, I've, damn, already five? Damn. So, finish my story. I, uh, you know, the, old, the, uh, the elderly man gave me this thing, and I was like, great, it was nice, but I wouldn't really pay that much attention. And then I was invited to a clandestine meeting of uh, compañeros that belong to an organization called Las FPL, the Fuerzas Populares de Liberación which is one of the five political military organizations of the FMLN guerrillas. And I was excited because they were gonna talk about revolution and there was gonna be a guy who was one of the most important revolutionaries in the history of El Salvador. And so, you know, this guy had fought since the 1940s. He had fought in the mountains uh, in the 80s and 90s. And his kids were part of the foundation of this organization that I was gonna become a member of, the FPL. And he was just an inspired figure. I was gonna go check him out and I went to this meeting and I'm waiting for Nukera and who pops out of, the, out of the door when they say, compañeros, les presentamos Jose Belisario Peña. 
Who was it? El viejito, the old man who was trying to give me the cassettes. I was like, fuck. I felt, I felt that small because I was being so youthfully arrogant before this titanic figure in Salvadoran history. And I got, became friends with him, and he was a mentor to me, and he kind of played Obi-Wan Kenobi to so many of us, pointing the way of like, and I, you know, you ask him, how did you sustain your struggle? What did he say? La cultura. And so I, I start off with that, and I want to talk just briefly about what I call sustainable struggle. How do we sustain our struggles. We need a sustainable planet and we're not going to get a sustainable planet without a sustainable struggle. A collective and individual sustainable struggle. And so, I'm not just talking about doing yoga, by the way, for those of you that are, what do you call it? So, um, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I'm a strong believer in what I call the strategic value of the sublime and the beautiful. When, you know, when you're facing difficult circumstances as we face in El Salvador and we face here and we face in the world now, beauty plays an extraordinarily important part. Just, for example, ask friends of mine who were trained in, in Vietnam by the greatest military, political military strategists of the 20th century, if not in history. The Vietnamese generals that defeated not just uh, the U.S., they also defeated the French and other powers. And when I asked my friends who were trained by them, hey, what's the Jedi knowledge of revolution that you learned from the Vietnamese? They said basically that politics and war are primarily um, spiritual acts, uh, which could translate into psychological or cultural even. And so the Vietnamese premise was that you needed to develop a, a force, a political military force, that could sustain and win fights over a sustained period of time. And culture and spirit play a fundamental part because has anybody ever had a bullet fly by their head besides say somebody like my friend Pablo here and others? Because if you ever have a bullet fly by, God forbid that you would, but when you do, I guarantee you the thing that you don't ask is, Jesus help me, that didn't come up as far as I remember. <laughs> and sadly it didn't even say, Marx help me. The question becomes, what the fuck am I doing here? Why am I doing this? And when you ask those kind of questions, you're going to issues of story. What is your story? You need a story that will help you sustain your struggle. Political, military, personal, cultural. So, um, you know, and I, I, I translate this as, as a writer that my job is to... Um, connect the epic because we're in an epic moment we're not being told that yeah. we need to connect the epic to the intimate mm. that's the role of the cultural organizer I believe <laughs> and uh, I mean our adversaries know this like the Christian fascists they know it very well I used to be one before I was a militant in the FMLN I was a militant Christian mm. born again believer the interpretation of the Bible that they have that we had and they have now is a militaristic interpretation of the Bible. So they're fighting for the, to save the world in a world awash in evil. And they're clear and they're focused and they're kicking liberal progressives' ass. And I'm going to wrap up, but uh, you know, I think that um, you know, we need to uh, translate our our, our, our work and to what's called demandas populares. The, how do you translate that? Popular demands? You know, how do you, how do you, you know, and, and, and to show agency while also connecting it to the intimate work of healing to sustain ourselves, of, of um, nurturing, of solace, because we're at a very uncertain time. And I think as cultural workers, we need to be very cognizant of our own intimate needs and connecting them to the epic moment that we're not being told about. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Can I see through either a show of hands or standing up, how many people in this room consider themselves cultural workers? 
how many is that? <laughs> you give me the like first. third. 60%, 60%? I feel like less. 55, 60, yeah. 50, 40, so, so this is a question for all of us. Uh, before we um, hear from our, our last panelist, the question is, what are some of the uh, um, opportunities that this current epic moment offers to facilitate the production and consumption of a people's art? What are some of the opportunities? Um, I, I, I want to infuse in all of us who are here today that we are super dope. <laughs> We're super cool. We're, you know, super bad. We've been to a lot of festivals and we've been to, um, you know, film festivals and we've been to music festivals and we've been to all kinds of festivals. And for me, almost all of the traditional quote unquote festivals that I've been to, I always find that there is something lacking. And usually it's the true voice of the people. Whether it's the music, culturally, what's being offered on the campus of the, of the festival. And so we have an opportunity, I think, to bring ourselves to some of these more traditional spaces. And in the amazing work of Ag Augusto Baul, uh, with um, using theater of the oppressed, just, you know, try it on. It's really, really effective. And if we, I always feel like if we could f somehow bring together pockets of theater of the oppressed uh, facilitators and people who will buy into coming together in the process of that, whether it's innovation in the physical arts, like, like creating posters or murals, or whether it's the performing arts, I feel like we, there's a way for us to infiltrate spaces peacefully and be welcomed in. So I ask all of us here today and those on the panel, please answer the question if you can. What are some of the opportunities in this current moment, this epic moment that offers to facilitate the production and consumption of a people's art? I'll start because I'm sure there's going to be epic answers after this. <laughs> I think some of the union organizing that has been happening, um, IAFI last year, which was the um, movie and TV film union organizing, is a huge opportunity, um, as well as even the Amazon uh, win that happened. Christian Smalls really employed culture. I mean, I learned that he was previously trying to be a rapper and found his voice actually through union organizing. How much more of that do we need? Artists channeling um, their gifts into really organizing. Um, another opportunity I've seen is artists self-organizing. Um, I'm seeing a ton of study groups that are, pro again, this is maybe not as sexy, but <laughs> folks who are really trying to study and unlearn what they have been taught. <laughs> um, some that I'm aware of, um, anti-capitalism for artists, that folks can check out as a 10-week study program, uh, the Union for Musicians and Allied Workers, which is organizing against Spotify, um, even troubling your own use of Spotify. Like, why is that the dominant platform that we use? Um, and actually looking for alternatives. Did you know that there is an artist-owned music streaming platform called Resonate? <laughs> These are the types of searching for alternatives, I think, um, is a huge opportunity that, again, it's small right now, but we need you and we need more people. Um, I would also say an opportunity is some of the movements for um, a universal basic income that are happening for artists in New York City right now. There's about to be 5,000 artists, I believe, that will be funded, I believe, two grand a month. Um, for about two years, or they will be placed with an arts organization, um, a paid of a living salary to, to work for two years with an organization. I think some of these UBI experiments are really powerful. And then finally, I'll say some of the potential around the Green New Deal and um, public employment of artists that we need to resurrect, um, that we saw you know, in the 1930s that we're having more of this conversation today. So that's a little bit to kick us off on, on opportunities. Great. I would, mine is, uh, I feel like this is great systems. I'm gonna go like super, um, in, like um, 
the yeah, micro, macro, micro, um, intimate. Um, there is there, technology has us occur like we are in connection with one another and that we're building all these relationships and that we have so much capacity to like move and connect to so many people. And I think we're forgetting how to be with one another as human beings. And so I feel like one of the most powerful and critical pieces to building both movement but also um, really engaging culture making and art of the people inside of um, social change movement and also in, in size of building a, a, a future more love and justice has to do with this, it's, it's individual relationships. How are we treating the people who are inside of our lives and our circle? How are you, how are you treating the parking attendant? How are you treating the, the person who, you know, brings, brings you your mail, who takes out the trash, the, like all of the like little tiny my, like all of the relationships that are in your life, how are those rippling into connection, into being with people, into listening to people, into knowing people's names, how to connect with them. And again, this is the ancestral technology, right? Like if you look at all of the forms that are rooted in community practice, salsa, capoeira, breaking, um, I mean, all of, all of these forms that are dance music forms that are rooted in community and rooted in these these resilience building and hope building practices, they have to do with relationship. They have to do with people being with people, people sharing stories with one another, people listening to one another and really being with one another. And we're forgetting how to do that. And, and so my encouragement of all of us is show up for one another, show up inside of places where people, human beings are gathering and are singing together, are moving together, are playing drums together, are marching together tomorrow, right? Like these ideas of actually showing up with your body versus your phone or your technology. And, and I really believe deeply that that is, that is the place where I, I feel in my own life, in my own work with the artists that I get to the pleasure of being able to build movements with, I feel such a difference and such powerful ripples that happen when we show up with our bodies. So that's what I'm, yeah. Yeah, definitely. The potluck, the potluck is underrated. Yes. <laughs> Let's get back to the potluck. So Gentlemen. Anything to add? No? Okay, beautiful. So I would like to um, close out this uh, moment with us together, um, s close to as we started with acknowledging the ancestors and showing a video from our panelist, Israel Rojas from Cuba. And um, for us to also be mindful of having the presence of those who are so often um, disregarded and shoved aside. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you all so much for joining us today. After the video, please feel, after the video, please feel free to come up and get a poster um, by Ernesto Yerena. And again, I want to thank the People's <laughs> Forum for this People's Summit and for all of you for participating. Thank you. Before we do that, oh, can I do one thing? <laughs> Sorry. I want to just make sure you have an opportunity to show up with your body outside. After this, we are going to be gathering for an hour of movement for the movement in uh, this tent that's right outside of there. So if you want to come and move your body and connect with one another and feel a little bit of joy and resilience building practices, come out and join us. And a shout out to the People's <laughs> Art Wall outside. I hope yes. everybody's had a chance to check out the, the art. People's Yay! Art Wall. And also a shout out to all of the interpreters. Yes. And yes. everyone who has been um, volunteering and assisting everyone today here on the campus. Salud. Soy Israel. Soy Israel Rojas, fiel director de la agrupación cubana Buena Fe. Desde La Habana, eh, me ha sido invitado a este forum para hablar sobre resistencias culturales y estas temáticas, y para mí es un verdadero gusto, porque además de compositor y músico, realmente en los últimos años he sido productor de varias agrupaciones folclóricas, jóvenes creadores en mi país, y he colaborado con otros creadores, sobre todo de la región, latinoamericanos. Conozco o creo conocer algo de por dónde va el tema de la creación artística, eh, y sobre todo más que la creación, porque ella goza de vitalidad y de fuerza en toda la región. 
eh, más bien de la distribución y la capacidad que tengan esas obras de ser reflejo de los pueblos, de las comunidades, de las subculturas, muchas que componen eh, la diversidad humana que hoy puebla esta región y puebla eh, nuestro mundo. ¿no? Definitivamente, como bien dice el gran intelectual Pascual Serrano, hoy no haría falta eh, condenar a Antonio Machado a una prisión hasta que muera de tuberculosis o condenar a Víctor Jara a morir de la manera horrible que todos sabemos. Hoy sencillamente te podrían silenciar los grandes hegemones culturales, podrían sencillamente silenciarte si no eres políticamente correcto, adecuado, si no eres, digamos, lo que se espera de ti, que lamentablemente esos grandes hegemones comerciales imponen o tributan a una filosofía de vida, de mundo, depredador con la naturaleza, absolutamente enajenante de las verdaderas preocupaciones de, de nuestra gente y casi siempre escapistas hacia lo lúdico, lo, lo divertido, lo aquí y ahora, lo mañana no existe, disfruta la sexualización de la mujer o incluso, por desgracia, eh, prácticas que por un lado intentan la liberación, todo el discurso político, todo el esfuerzo de los eh, movimientos sociales, de, del pensamiento progresista, incluso de una parte del pensamiento de derecha que trata de comprender lo, la complejidad de, de, del ser humano contemporáneo, eh, va por un lado y sin embargo la industria cultural y sus discursos éticos y estéticos van por otro. Parece cosa menor, parece cosa o terreno abandonado para, para el gran capital, para, el, para la gran industria del, del entretenimiento, pero lamentablemente tiene un efecto depredador, porque cada día son menos los fondos para potenciar la cultura de estos segmentos preteridos, de ritmos autóctonos, de toda la riqueza eh, cultural de nuestra región. Si lo sabremos nosotros, que incluso estando en Cuba bloqueados y con una situación precaria en lo económico, se destinan recursos y protección y hay una voluntad estatal de, de proteger estos, estos proyectos y estas expresiones. Y aún así, más temprano que tarde, la carencia, la pobreza, la falta de recursos, termina más temprano que tarde golpeándoles su desarrollo. ¿Qué quedará para esos otros pueblos donde las expresiones artísticas tienen que remar a contracorriente, muchas veces con subvenciones eh, muy precarias y, y en otras olvidadas? Lo hemos visto en países como El Salvador, lo hemos visto en Guatemala, hemos eh, lidiado con, con creadores que nos cuentan lo complicado, lo difícil eh, del desarrollo de su actividad y muchas veces la desestimulación o sencillamente la falta de apoyo los termina eh, priva privando a esos pueblos y a esas comunidades del de arte maravilloso que podrían generar. Por un lado eso, y por otro, ya que hablamos de la, de, de la industria cultural, yo creo que desde Cuba eh, no basta solamente con la denuncia de lo que acabo de decir, que creo que de alguna manera es evidente y ya todos lo sabemos. Yo creo que es muy importante el llamado ahora que parece que vuelve una ola progresista, el llamado a los decisores, a los políticos, a no considerar las artes cosa menor, a no considerar la integración cultural de los países latinoamericanos cosa menor. Lamentablemente en el pasado los esfuerzos fueron mínimos en ese sentido y aunque se, se hicieron foros, reuniones y cosas, la verdad no se llegó a nada. Nunca se pudo concretar una discográfica, una gran productora, un canal de televisión que difundiera solamente arte latinoamericano, arte de calidad. Resultado, nuestros referentes siguen siendo esos hegemones occidentales y casi siempre, bueno, que ya lo hemos visto, que si el Eurovisión, que si el Grammy, que si toda esa mierda, que lamentablemente o estás ahí o no existes. O nos armamos nosotros y nos articulamos o seguiremos respondiendo siempre al que paga, que manda. Un abrazo grande. Chao. Before we leave, are there any last comments, brief comments from the panelists? Anything? I've also got stickers here if you want as well. When you take a poster, please feel free to help yourselves. You want to say that? Yeah. No, no, no. I, would love, I would love to just, I mean, sorry to make a, a shameless promotion, but this is what it is to be an artist in the United States of America. Uh, we, are, we are doing a, a summer intensive. It's a two-week 
training for artivists. And um, if you're interested and you want to move your body and you're interested in dancing and getting down, it's here in Los Angeles. Uh, lots of scholarships available. Don't let money be the reason why you don't come. Uh, we've never turned anyone away. Uh, it's, it is called Contra Tiempo Futuro, and it's about building a future that is full of more love and just, justice, but through our bodies as our primary tools. Um, we have a table over there in the tent, and we're going to be there for the next two days. And also, we're going to be drumming and dancing and getting down tomorrow during the march. So come out and, and join us. And yeah. I would just say, I would just say again, thank you to uh, Manolo, Claudia, and the crew yes. of People's Forum. Uh, this culture kills fascists. Remember that. Woo! This culture kills fascists. <laughs> no, que se quede solamente un mensaje eh, de que eh, tenemos que superar la crisis del pes. Do this, it is necessary for art, for culture to walk hand in hand with uh, economic and social change. So we have to think in this way. We have to think about our plans. How are we going to make this happen so we can truly build a future that we want? That's, that's it. People! Power! Si se puede. <laughs>